Welcome back to the Gentleman's Gazette and our series on bespoke shoes, where we'll show you how a custom pair of shoes is handmade from start to finish by Amara Hark Weber. In today's episode, we'll talk about insoles, how it is attached to the last, how it is cut, how it is shaped, and last but not least, how the channels are added so the shoe can come together as a whole. So, without further ado, let's get to the bottom of things. <laughs> Frankly, at first, I never thought about it that way. But the insole is actually the heart of the shoe. It's where everything comes together, the uppers as well as the soles. The insole is really essential for the comfort of the wearer and the structure of the shoe. As Amara says, They say the insole is like the backbone of the shoe. It's supporting your weight, it's conforming to your movement, and the uppers and everything is sewn through it. So the insole is really like the key. It's really, it's, it's super important um, to do it well and to do it right because if there's a problem on the insole, there's gonna be a problem with the shoe. True words by a custom bespoke shoemaker. But of course, this is true for custom shoes. In reality, the vast majority of shoes, even dress shoes, do not have a high quality insole. For my insoles, Mara chose the JR soles, which she liked for the right amount of flexibility, stiffness, and structure. Of course, JR stands for Johann Rendenbach, which is German, and I told her how to pronounce that. Johann Rendenbach from Germany. Yes, JR. Johann Rendenbach. <laughs> Did I say it? Uh, it's that. Sound yeah, like as, <laughs> yeah. As an American, I struggle with German. I tell you, so I stick with JR. Um, Especially if there's Germans in the room. In most cases, the shoemaker will just use an insole that they think is right. It's typically not something that you as a customer get to choose. Primarily, it's important that they're oak bark tanned, which is a natural process that takes quite a while with the use of bark and the concentrations are increased over time. Frankly, it doesn't matter if it, the letter comes from Italy, England, or Germany, as long as it's oak bark tanned. Different people swear by different things. Personally, I don't think they make that much of a difference. As long, of course, as they're quality leathers from quality manufacturers. Honestly, shoemakers know their interior leather and they have preferences for one or the other. So unless you have a really good reason to pick a very distinct leather, I would leave it up to a shoemaker if I were you. So why not just use tooling leather or thinner leather or even cardboard on bespoke shoes, just like in the majority of all the other shoes? Well, if you spend so much time on labor, it's really not worth using anything but the best raw material. Moreover, the beauty about this oak bark tent leather is that while it's stiffer and structured, it's soft at the same time and molds to your foot in combination with the cork filling underneath of it. Sometimes on bespoke shoes, you will see the original insole uncovered in the final shoe. Some shoemakers will use a sock liner, which is typically made of the same leather as the lining, so it creates a uniform look inside the shoe. Most shoes have a half sock liner, which means when you look into the shoe from the top, you'll see a uniform color, but when you look further inside, you can see in the front of the shoe where your ball is, that's the original insole. Now, there's also such a thing as a full sock liner, which means you don't see anything of the insole anymore at all. And personally, that's my preference because with the half sock liners over time, they'll come loose and it is usually a little uncomfortable. Alternatively, just going without the sock liner is also great if you want that purest feel of bespoke shoe, having that high quality leather directly in touch with your feet. To start with the insole, Amara makes a rough cut from a larger hide of leather. Once it's cut, she'll trim it down at the workstation. At first, she traces the last to create the proper size for the insole. Time to meet another tool, the so-called five-in-one. It's a useful leather cutting machine because it can do weld rolling, sole cutting, heel trimming, edge beveling, and skiving. Here, Amara uses it to cut down the insole to the proper size. Next, the soles are submerged into water. That helps them adhere to the last better and they mold better to that shape of the last. So it's like they become one with the last. But first, the leather is glassed. 
What the heck is that? Well, it's a bit like sanding just with a piece of glass, which is typically faster and more efficient. Amara uses the piece of glass to buff off the finish of the leather because if she doesn't do that, it may crack because of the wetting and putting it onto the last. That insole has to be attached to the last in some way. And typically, that's done with tacking. Now, Amara does it down the center line. There are many different ways to do this. Of course, you may wonder, why not tack it all around the last? Because the more, the better. Well, keep in mind that this insole is the product that we'll see later on the inside of the shoe, and you don't want it to be full of holes. The tacks Amara uses are really small, so later on, you likely won't see holes on the insoles unless you look really closely, and of course, only if you won't have a full sock liner. This app really highlights that shoemaking is a multi-sensory endeavor. You need your eyes, you need the feeling in your fingers, and you need the vision of what's going to happen. Shoemaking is really visceral. Like I can feel and hear when the nail goes, hits the right spot, yeah. but you wouldn't be able to see it. You can see here, Amara really molds the sole onto the last with her hands. As the leather sets, it has to be tightly adhered to the last. You don't want any gaps in between the sole and the last. In order to achieve that, the sole is tied down. Amara uses ribbon or muslin. Other people use things like bike tires. There's really no right or wrong thing. At the end of the day, it just has to be strong and do the job of adhering and shaping that insole fully to the last. Getting it flush is particularly important in the arch and instep area. I mean, look at that final thing. It looks like a creatively wrapped up birthday present. Cake, anyone? No? My favorite cake is not German chocolate cake. Well, now that the lasts are gift wrapped, they have to rest, the insole has to dry, and at the end of the process, it will have the exact shape of the bottom of the last. Once Amara leaves the shoes to dry for several days, it's now time to trim the leather. And now you can see that the leather is a little bit larger than the last. We have to cut that down and prepare it for the welt to be sewn onto. So how to do it right? Well, first you remove the excess leather around the perimeter. Amara begins by removing the tacks she put in initially. Of course, safety first. You notice she has a thick towel underneath her lap. First of all, that collects the debris, but also acts as a safety measure in case her knife slips. Amara keeps her knives and tools sharp at all times and does it herself. They're so sharp, they even hurt to brush against the blade. You certainly don't want that going into your leg. In addition to being careful not cutting herself, she also has to take great care of how the leather is cut. Otherwise, the process has to start all over. Likewise, Amara wants to avoid nicking the wooden last. Why? Well, excessive or large gouges can compromise the leather once it's on the last. Notice the unusual way Amara is holding her knife? That control is important. Amara wants her cat to be nice and tight, and so she uses her fingers to follow along the lines to check for any irregularities or bumps. For aesthetic purposes, Amara is very careful around the toe area. Why? Well, it's very prominent, so any flaw becomes much more impactful. The instep near the arch is also a particular area of concern. The reason to pay particular attention here is that it has such an overall impact on the comfort level of the shoe. What exactly will work best for you depends on the way you walk. For example, if your foot tends to roll inwards when you walk, or if you have weak or fallen arches, it's typically advisable to leave this area high to provide an extra support and comfort for you. For me, Amara is shooting for something in the middle that gets us a somewhat slim waist without compromising the comfort of the shoe. Initially, I'd requested a slim fiddleback waist, so it was interesting to see how it all came together. When it's time to shape the instep, your shoemaker will likely reference the measurements just so they get everything right. As you can see, Amara applies water to the leather so she can carefully shape the area of the instep. Again, she uses glass here instead of sandpaper because it is faster and more efficient, and therefore the shoe will cost less. Really, you're not losing anything in precision. Amara is really good with it, and so glass is the material of her choice for sanding in this instance. As you can see, using the hand to round the area around the instep creates a curve, and it visually makes the waist appear slimmer. Looking at the final shoe, 
I wish the waist turned out slimmer. Why? Well, that it's not something you typically get with a ready-to-wear shoe, but it's usually reserved for a custom shoe. Now, of course, I also don't have the slimmest feet, so Amara tried to go somewhere in the middle. Maybe the next shoe, she can make it a little slimmer. That being said, the shoe and the waist don't look anything like a ready-to-wear shoe. It truly looks like a bespoke product. Now, to help Amara keep the work symmetrical, she works on both shoes simultaneously. She doesn't just finish one and then start with the other. Otherwise, it's much more difficult to get them even, consistent, and the way she wants them. You can see she reviews constantly going back and forth to keep things equitable. The goal is that the lines of the last continue on the insole. That means it's not just cut down straight, but the line and the shape and the flow will make it look like it's one piece of a material, not a layer of leather paired with a wooden last. That the insole really follows the line of the last. And so that's really what I want is for this to, to match up and be an extension of the last. This type of work requires careful attention to detail. The more work your shoemaker puts in at this stage, the higher the likelihood to get a perfect result. In a lot of ways, this process really showcases how shoemakers are artists or sculptors more so than a pure craftsman. I like this part. I like anything that has to do with the lasts. I like last. I don't know why. It's just a sculpture. It looks like so nice. During this work, you may end up with sharp edges that could penetrate the lining later, which is why Amara softens them so it won't be an issue later on. The tool she uses here is called an edger. Well, that's a pretty obvious name, but it's very accurate. Frankly, it's German in spirit because Germans can be very literal. One pair of pants later. Did you know what a snail lives in? A Schneckenhaus, which means snail house. Mara says she heard horror stories about unblunted edges that eventually worked their way through the leather, destroying it. And of course, that's not what we want. While she never experienced it herself, she likes to blunt the edges just because it looks nicer. It's also easier to look at any bumps or imperfections in the leather that way. In the next step, Amara uses a finishing rod, which smoothens and compacts the leather. She thinks this tool is actually a recycled hammer handle, but it has exactly the right curvature for the bottom of the insole. Waste not, want not. Now that the insoles are trimmed down, Amara gives both shoes a final look because she wants them to be equal. They look all right to me, so let's keep going. Now it's time to make the hole fast. Engaged enemy frigate at six bells. No, not like that. The hole fast refers to a portion of the insole next to the channel. It has been carefully carved out and is perforated with holes. Why the holes? Well, they're there so the welt can be sewn onto it. The whole fast consists of this channel that covers about 270 degrees of the shoe. As you may know, some shoe companies advertise their 360 Goodyear welt, but frankly, for a hand welted shoe, 360 makes absolutely no sense. In Amara's case, the whole face covers about three quarters of the shoe. There are other shoemakers that sometimes only do it half of the shoe and use wooden pegs in the waist area. There's no right or wrong. It all depends on what technique the shoemaker prefers. The most likely thing to go wrong is to make a cut that is too deep, because if that happens, you will see and feel it on the inside of the shoe on the insole. That can be overcut. I've seen, and I may have done it once or twice myself, cutting too deep and cutting through the whole insole. If you look at their ready-to-wear shoes, chances are they will not have a holdfast. A holdfast is something you will only find on a hand-welted shoe. So a Blake or Blake Rapid construction has no holdfast. Neither does a Goodyear welted shoe. A machine Goodyear welted shoe has something called a gem band, which is basically a piece of fabric that is glued onto the insole. In a Goodyear welted shoe, nothing is worked out of the insole the way it is on a bespoke shoe that is hand welted. Now, could you make a bespoke shoe that is Goodyear welted? Absolutely. You could also make a cemented bespoke shoe, but most of the time, shoemakers 
will do with a proper hand weld. Obviously, it takes a lot longer to make a hand welted shoe than a cemented shoe or a Goodyear welted shoe. And because of that, it's more expensive. So how do you get the actual hole fast into the insole? The final result looks pretty cool, doesn't it? Mara begins by drawing a guideline of the channel with a pen. She's so talented, she does it freehand and then just double checks the measurements. I could not do that. I mean, I could, but it would look like crap. Next, she uses a little brush to apply water along the desired route of the channel. This makes the letter softer and easier to cut. Using a very sharp knife, Amara now scores the leather. She's very careful to fully control the knife without going too deep. At the same time, she wants to maintain a steady depth so the channel looks very uniform at the end. After that initial cut, so after that initial cut, so after this initial cut, so after, this initial cut so after this initial cut, she switches tools and now uses the channel opener. This is a tool that opens the channel. Now, shoemakers are obviously a creative bunch. The nomenclature of the tools, not so much. The channel opener is not the last step though. It just provides enough room for the final two. Let me guess, it's called a channel. Eh. It's actually called welt plow or feathering knife. So Amara now carefully follows the initial channel with her welt plow. This expands the size of the channel to her desired width. As a shoemaker, you need a very steady hand here to keep it even and wide without having any wobbles in it. At the same time, you don't want to cut yourself. Once again, Amara glasses the leather to keep things smooth. Having completed the channel, Amara can now add the holes to the hold fast so the final weld can be sewn. These holes are made with an awl and Amara leaves about seven millimeters or a little over a quarter inch in between the holes. Now the exact distance can always vary a little bit because Amara is more concerned about the angle of the hole in the hold fast or in the channel as the shoe is curving. Personally, I was very impressed to see how well Amara could gauge where her final awl would come out. When I'm sewing on a button, sometimes I think my needle will come out here, but then it doesn't. She, on the other hand, got it right every single time. Frankly, you'll never see this later, but I was impressed to see this level of perfectionism here. Now it's time to let the insoles dry because if they're wet and they dry, they get a little smaller and you don't want to make things perfect in a wet state just to then find that the final product is too small. So now that the insoles are fully channeled, we can pull the upper over the last and attach it to it. But all that you'll see in our next video. <laughs>